Um, but if, if this is your first Sunday with us, if you've not been with us for a while, we've, we've been doing this series that's all about the book of Acts. And we, we've called this series Movement, Momentum and Multiply. And uh, over the course of the last few weeks, we've just been seeing how the Holy Spirit has been moving amongst the early church community. John Stott famously said this, As a body without breath is a corpse, so the church without the Spirit is dead. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, then you and I would not be here. And this morning we find ourselves on Pentecost Sunday looking at a significant moment in the life of this early Christian community. You know, we already looked at chapter 2 a few months ago when the Holy Spirit comes like the blowing of a violent wind and tongues of fire appear on everyone's heads. And then they start speaking in all different kinds of languages. And it said, didn't it, that Jews from across the nations and converts to Judaism from other nations, they hear an outpouring of worship in their own language and they too believe and are baptised. And in this moment, it was as if God was saying, I have moved out of my house, which was the temple, and into you, believers. And then we've got our story this morning, which for Pentecost Sunday feels wholly appropriate. Because if what had happened earlier on in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, was the Jewish Pentecost, here in chapter 10, we can only see what can be described as the Gentile Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit comes upon the Gentiles. And if you don't know what Gentiles mean, because you've seen that word a lot this morning, to be a Gentile means somebody who isn't Jewish. It says, doesn't it, after Peter had preached the gospel to them, the good news of what Jesus has done, it says this, verse 34, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And so he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So what has been going on? Well, it's interesting, if you were to compare those two stories, that those those two, these two days of Pentecost, Peter knew that Jews who wanted to belong to the new movement had to repent of their sin. It says so in Acts 2. But up until now, up until this point, he would have said that Gentiles, if they wanted to belong, they would have to become Jews as well. And the point of this dramatic graphic and deeply human story is that though Gentiles too had to repent and believe just as Jews did, they did not have to become a Jew in the process. To put it bluntly, chaps wouldn't need to get a particular part of their anatomy cut anymore. (laughs) And we'll come back to that in a few months' time. But as well as that, from the the vision that Peter has of the sale and the different kinds of food and the command to take and eat, they wouldn't need to keep the kosher food laws either. And what we see later in the chapter is that the Spirit has fallen on them without them needing to be Jewish. And it's a massive change in the life of this movement. You know, I'm conscious of time this morning, and I can't see the clock, actually, because it's been obscured by a flag, so we could be here a while (laughs) if I really wanted to. But as I've, you know, conscious of time, as I've been thinking about this story this week, you know, I I did have an extra thousand or so words I could have gone on to, but we're not going to. But 
it left me curious when we read stories like this about the questions, oh, thank you, Alan, that we might ask. I've got 15 minutes. That's good. <laughs> thank you, Alan. <laughs> the Spirit's going to fall and we're going to be here till 10 o'clock tonight. I guarantee it. There are some questions that I think this, qu- this kind of story leads us to ask. And the first is this. How much do we listen to or ignore the Old Testament? How much do we listen to it and how, what, you know, how much do we ignore it? You know, I know that many of you have been spending your time this year working through the Bible in a year. And if you're anything like me, uh, where I've got to in my one, I'm, I've just gone through Nehemiah, I've gone through Ezra, and I'm now on Job, okay? Uh, so that's been good fun. Um, but the reason I ask this question is that there are parts of the Old Testament that feel very different to the New Testament. That's not just me, is it? You know, it, they, they feel quite different. At times they can be quite jarring. And the way that God seems to operate in the New Testament feels at times to be very different to the way that he operated in the past. And I think this morning, this story seems to highlight that and make that more obvious and apparent. Because here you have seemingly the rules being broken. Rules that had been put in place in the Old Testament. And now they're being broken and it doesn't seem to bother God like it did in the Old Testament. And it makes us ask the question, you know, has God changed And I think that's something of a logical conclusion when we come to passages like this. That if in this instance the rules no longer need to be followed, then maybe actually we just need to disregard the Old Testament entirely. You know, the New Testament's nicer, isn't it? There's less killing and things like that going on there. Let's just focus on the New Testament. Surely that's easier. But, you're waiting for it. I think when we do that, we are not reading the text faithfully and properly. The Old Testament, and particularly the food laws and things like that, they were in there in a place for a time and a purpose. You know, I think the best way to get our heads around all of this is to realize that throughout the Bible, God is the same. Now, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is slow to anger. He is rich in mercy. He is abounding in love. God is the same. But in order to fully appreciate what is happening here, we have to realize that God's plan has developed. God is the same, but his plan has developed. His plan for his people, his cherished creation, has proceeded beyond the point where they need to have food laws and other rules in place to keep them holy. What we see happening in this chapter this morning was always God's intention. By choosing and blessing one family like he does in the Old Testament, he intended to bless all the families of the earth. Psalmists and prophets, they foretold the day when God's Messiah would inherit the nations. The Lord's servant would be their light. All nations would flow to the Lord's house. And God would pour out his spirit on all people. Like anything, when there are some rules in place though... The tragedy was that Israel had twisted this belief about election into one of favoritism. Rather than being a light to other nations, they had become deeply filled with racial hatred. They despised Gentiles as dogs and they developed traditions that kept them apart. You know, people always go on about the time that Jesus gets really angry, don't they? The one time we see Jesus angry in the temple. Now Jesus' gripe with the money money changers in the temple, it wasn't one of economics. 
it was because the money changers had set up shop in the Gentile part of the temple. It was a system that was put in place that was keeping the Gentiles apart. And on top of that, no Orthodox Jew would ever enter the home of a Gentile, even someone who was sympathetic to Judaism, or they would never invite anyone like that into their own home. You know, the taboos of food and family had been set up by God to do a proper and important job of keeping Israel for himself, separate from the rest of the world. But it was always his plan that through Israel, the rest of the world would be saved. And now in Jesus and by the Spirit, God had carried out that plan. Jesus had become the place and the means by which God was now meeting people with mercy and grace. And so, my friends, it's so tempting to say, let's just ignore the Old Testament. But the whole sweep of the Bible is important. It's a story of redemption, of how God gets his children back. And that's his plan, that's his intention for all people, not just the Jews. You know, we listen to the Old Testament because every story whispers the name of Jesus. I've gone over already, five minutes, that's got, I've got ten. So that's the first question. The second question that this kind of story makes me ask, how do we discern God's voice? I think that the second trap that we fall into is as long as you think God has said something to you, then you can disregard everything else. So here in this moment, Peter is given a vision, and on the basis of that vision, it will have repercussions for the whole church moving forwards. So how do we discern that something is God's voice, and you're not just talking to yourself? Because regularly, and you don't need me to tell you this, throughout Christian history, over the last 2,000 years, there have been moments where people have apparently had a fresh revelation and then decided to take church in a completely different direction. Seemingly having fresh revelation that disregards everything that goes before. And this is dangerous territory. So the question is important. How do we discern God's voice? I think that one of the things we notice is that Peter is consistent in measuring it against Scripture. If you look at verse 43, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. He sees the plan in Scripture He goes back to Scripture to tell whether or not it is God's voice. Although what is going on is, you know, it's apparent that this is a new way, it isn't completely disregarding what has been said in the Old. You know, that passage in Joel speaks of it, doesn't it? Of the day of the Lord where I will pour out my Spirit on all people. And it's why answering that first question was so important first. Because does this sound as though it's according to God's greater plan that we find in Scripture? That is a way of discerning it. Is this part of what seems to be God's plan? Later on, we'll see in chapter 15 how the Council of Jerusalem meets to discuss all of this. If we'd had time this morning, we'd have also gone a bit further into chapter 11, where Peter tells his friends, those who are gathered, about what has happened, and he tests it against them. This is the input of what we'd call the Council of Saints. That's another way that we discern the voice of God. The Council of the Saints. Now, we're Baptists. We love a church meeting, don't we? We love it. We love it. Because we're going to come together and we're going to discern the mind of Christ together. And we do that because we actually believe that the Holy Spirit speaks through each of us. That each of us can contribute 
And through the counsel of saints, we can discern God's voice. And not only that, if you actually look, there's also a lot of common sense that goes on in this passage. How many times does Peter have this picture? Three times. Three times he's told this picture. And after the first one, he get, what does he do? He questions it, doesn't he? He goes, is this really it? So a way that we test whether it is God's voice or whether it's ours is we ask God, is this really you? And if you're lucky, then he will. He'll bring it to you again. You know, I, I could go into detail about how that has happened in my own life. I'm not going to go down that storyline again because you've probably heard it before. But come and ask me where I've seen that happen in my own life later on if you're interested. But quite often it's common sense. If God keeps giving you the same word, and when you've asked him, is this you or is this me, and he keeps giving it to you, the likelihood is it's God. As long as you've then measured it against scripture, and maybe asked someone, what do you think? I think the third question this passage also then makes us ask, does God accept everyone? Does God accept everyone? I think the third issue when we read this passage is there's a bit of a danger that things become open season. And what I mean by that is it doesn't matter what you're like, it doesn't matter what you've done, you are welcome. Now I have to say, that's sort of true, isn't it? That is sort of true. But on other levels, it's not. And what I mean by that is there is a difference between acceptance and invitation. The invitation is for everybody. Everybody is invited. Everybody can be included because they are invited. But that doesn't mean we stay the same as before. One of the things that we regularly see in Jesus' ministry is the instruction to repent, to change, to sin no more. It's not, you know, just carry on as you've been doing, that's absolutely fine. The invitation is to transformation. If what Peter had discovered was that God simply accepts everyone the way they are, what was the fuss about Cornelius being devout and God-fearing? Why bother sending for Peter to come and tell him about Jesus? It's because the truth is, my friends, all paths don't lead to God. It's a narrow road. And the reason Cornelius was a devout worshipper of Israel's God was precisely he was fed up with the normal Roman gods and eager to follow what he thought was the, the right one. But it's not the case then that God simply accepts us as we are. He invites us as we are, but responding to the invitation always involves the complete transformation which is acted out in repentance, forgiveness, baptism, and receiving the Spirit. My friends, you can, let me spell it out as bluntly as I can. You can be a good person. You can be a good person, but you still need to know Jesus. You know, I think one of the things that this story makes clear is that Jesus is the missing piece. You know, I think that some people like to think, you know, I, I give money to charity, but I even give it to church, who knows? And you can believe that there's some kind of God in the world. You know, you're going to be nice to people, and that's enough. That's all you need. But my friends, that's not true. All are invited and welcome to know Jesus. But you need to repent and be transformed by the Holy Spirit. Two things as I close, because I'm conscious of time. I've gone over it. It doesn't matter, though. You love it. The first is this. God has no favourites. God has no favourites. Now, that doesn't mean that God runs the world like a democracy or that, you know, he simply validates and accepts everyone's opinion about everything or everyone's chosen lifestyle. 
What it means is that there are no ethnic, geographical, cultural or moral barriers any longer in the way of anyone and everyone being offered forgiveness and new life. Cornelius didn't want God to tolerate him. He wanted to be welcomed, forgiven, healed and transformed. And he was. And what this means is that Christians should never look down on a person from any race or ethnic group and say, you know, they're unfit to hear the gospel from me. We should never say, you know, they're too unclean for me to go into their house to share the gospel. Or, you know, that person over there, they're not worth evangelizing to. Or that person's a bit messed up and he's got too many rough habits. I'm not going to even go near them. There are no favorites. God has no favorites. You know, I, I remember <laughs> when I was coming to Woodbridge, um, one, of the, one of the challenges that I had was that I'd just gone to see a church on a really rough council housing estate. And, uh, you know, I, at the time, I really felt that that was where God was calling me to. And, and I remember thinking, oh, you know, if I go there, these people, they really need to know Jesus. Look at them. They're, you know, it's really hard. It's a rough life there. You know, if they hear the gospel, their lives will be transformed. I still believe that it would be if they heard the gospel. But I remember when I came to Woodbridge and I saw all these well-together people with lots of money and loads of stuff and seemingly life all put together. You know what I realized? They need Jesus too. And if anything, it's harder to tell people about Jesus when they think they've got everything. And that's why I'm here. Because God has no favorites you can be rich, you can be poor. He loves each of us and he wants each of us to know Christ. And then secondly, we're to partner with God in breaking down walls. Now, I don't know if you noticed this this morning. This always does make me laugh a little bit when I see moments like this in the Bible. You know, we saw a few weeks ago how Jesus appears to Saul on the way to Damascus, doesn't he? And, and here at the beginning of this, you know, an angel appears. You know, could, you know, it could have been Jesus in that moment. Who knows? And in that moment, that angel could have told Cornelius the gospel, couldn't he? He could have told him about Jesus. He could have told him everything. But the angel, what does he do? He tells Cornelius to go and find Peter. Why? Why? Because God wants us to be involved in breaking down the walls that divide us. I think that in so many ways we are so, you know, entrenched and distant than we have ever been. You know, we saw it with things like Brexit, didn't we? You know, how people came so entrenched in a position, they got, oh, it was aggy towards each other. And I think just mentioning that word triggers people. It's like PTSD. Because it tended to be that you were either one way or the other. And, and we're seeing more of those kinds of things, more of those kinds of positions being held. Well, well, I think this, so you're wrong. And vice versa. We've become entrenched in a position. And I think that one of the dangers that we have is that we start living in an echo chamber. We gravitate to people who think the same way as us about everything. I think there's even a danger, even in church, that we become an echo chamber. That we only gravitate around other Christians. People like us, PLUs. But my friends, if this passage tells us any, uh, th anything this morning, it's that God is not interested in the barriers that we put up between us. Because he wants to tear them down. I think if the last few days have taught us anything, as communities have gathered together in mutual celebration of the Queen's Jubilee, I think we see something of God's desire for creation. We've seen neighbourhoods who would never do anything together normally. 
you know, whose homes are their castles and their drawbridge goes up as soon as they get home from work. But for a fleeting moment, we've seen a picture of how it will be for eternity. Every race, every nation, every social class, queen and commoner will be united and we will worship the one true king. I love how Randy Alcorn puts it. He puts it like this. Peace on earth will be accomplished, not by the abolition of our differences, but by unifying loyalty to the king. A loyalty that transcends differences and is enriched by them. My friends, God has no favourites. The Spirit came on the Jew and the Gentile. The Spirit can come on you and I. And then we have a great role to play in breaking down barriers, in taking the gospel to those who don't know him. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you live in us. Lord, it's because of you that we have security that we are his. And Lord and Heavenly Father, I, I pray that by your Holy Spirit you would use us Use us to be a people that aren't just content and comfortable to stay with those PLUs, people like us, but willing to be people who go out and venture out and break down barriers. Lord, if we, as we have seen people this past week being willing to go into their neighbourhoods to extend welcome and invitation to one another, Lord, may we be like that as a church. Lord, in the, in the neighbourhoods that we find ourselves. Lord, I thank you that you have, there is no favourites in your kingdom. There's no favouritism. You just want us to come to you, recognising that we, we can't do this on our own. We need your love. We need your mercy. We need your forgiveness. And we need to change. Lord, I, I pray that this morning, by your Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be the same people who came in through the door. I, I pray that, Lord. I pray this every week. People don't know I pray this. But I pray that people go out from here challenged to change. And that they would be changed, not by the words that I speak, but by your Holy Spirit moving in them. Fill us up, Lord. Send us out. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.